Hi, I'm Donald Sebastian, Senior Vice President for Research and Development here at NJIT, bringing you another Conversation from the Edge, where we meet NJIT faculty members, learn about their research, and how they bring that excitement into the classroom. Today's guest is Bharat Biswal, uh, new chair of our Department of Biomedical Engineering. Bharat, welcome to NJIT. Thank you, Dr. Sebastian. So tell me a little bit about how you got interested in the field that you're studying, uh, some of the places you've worked and how it led you here to NJIT. Um, I did uh, my uh, master's and uh, bachelor's in electrical engineering, but for my PhD, um, I got um, interested in medical imaging. I did my PhD in the Medical College of Wisconsin. And since the last 10, 11 years, I was at New Jersey Medical School just down the road. Um, so when an opportunity came at NJIT, I was very excited um, because I wanted to uh, work more closely with several faculties and also work with um, undergraduate and graduate uh, students in biomedical engineering. So I understand your particular field of research is uh, brain imaging. I, I think many people are familiar with the sort of amazing 3D imagery uh, that can allow us to detect our internal organs as we're on the table, but I think you're doing a whole lot more in your work than just the shape. Uh, you're not detecting disease after the fact. I think your work actually has to do with understanding uh, behaviors in real time. Am I right? Yeah, that's right. So maybe in the last 10, 12 years, especially uh, MRI has evolved into rather than structural imaging, which is taking pictures of your brain, um, into functional MRI where one can see how does you know different region function so we can now locate for almost any brain region what are the different function which is related to that so it has opened many avenues both for basic science for psychologist and um, behavioral neuroscience but also in clinical application if someone has a tumor in the brain, then we can do a study and basically map out the brain, which would help neurosurgeon to perform the neurosurgery. So um, I was very lucky uh, to be um, associated in a field um, which um, I could take part just at the inception of it um, in full. So when you say you're measuring brain activity, what, what exactly are we seeing? Are we seeing blood flow, electrical activity, all of the above, other things? What is it that your technology is, is, uh, is taking as a measurement to indicate the regions of the brain that are being uh, stimulated and going to work when we engage in the various tasks that we do? Um, that's a very good question. Um, and um, the brain function that we uh, observe um, typically reflects neuronal activity, but it's also uh, get affected or modulated by changes in blood flow. Therefore, in some cases like schizophrenia, where there is, or epilepsy, where is no, no known increase in blood flow, but increase or altered changes in neuronal activity, we can see how the brain is different in those cases. But also you can have cases um, like, um, a, or like certain brain tumor or AVMs where there is a change in blood flow and we can detect that also. So it's sensitive to both uh, neuronal changes as well as it can also detect changes in blood flow. So that's um, the advantage of fMRI because it's non-invasive unlike x-ray or PET imaging, but we can get very high resolution and measure um, very delicate changes in the brain. So I'm guessing these pictures are coming from an fMRI. Is, is there anything that we can see in these? Is there a particular phenomenon that you're looking at? Um, so what this picture is showing is that um, is mostly related to my primary research interest is to look for structure or spatial patterns in the brain even when a subject is not performing any specific task. So these subjects were scanned while they were simply resting. 
and what this figures show is that even when a subject is at rest, we can find specific spatial patterns in the brain. And this method has become quite popular in the last couple of years because um, you can imagine in a number of clinical cases like Alzheimer's, stroke, or uh, traumatic brain injury when a subject cannot perform tasks because they're not able to or in Alzheimer's they might forget the instruction. You could simply collect a subject while they're resting and find differences in their spatial brain pattern. That's amazing work. I, I understand that this has been cited at national level uh, for highly impactful results. Can you tell me a little bit about that award? Um, sure. Um, so um, one of the things that we did was, in addition to showing the results about resting scan, um, what we did was we pulled data from about 33 sites across five continents and released uh, publicly more than a thousand brain images from different subjects, healthy subjects, and we made it publicly available. And it has been it has been downloaded more than five thousand times by various researchers, and they are being analyzed um, and published. So, both the director of National Institute of Mental Health as well as the director of National Institute of drug abuse um, in their yearly report thought it was uh, uh, imp impactful sign so I was quite honored with that so we are still working along those lines trying to also release data sets not just of healthy controls but of clinical populations also. So you might think that we have very specialized locations in the brain for each of the things that we ask it to do and yet in the cases of traumatic brain injury, we often see that we can relearn uh, functionality that was lost due to injury. Does your technique show you something about the plasticity of the brain and, and the, the ability to retrain uh, and recover tasks that one would have thought lost to injury? Um, yeah, absolutely. I think like one of the challenges or the most interesting things about brain is how adaptable or how plastic it is, and uh, so we have been doing research in TBI, um, like right within 48 hours of the injury, um, and then scanning them three months or six months later, and seeing uh, what are the differences in pattern. Um, and like, obviously, one of the ultimate goal is to see whether we can. Um, predict recovery by using techniques like this. We have also done similar study in stroke patients where just after stroke we have scanned them and then three months or six months later during rehabilitation we can see how there is a you know changes. Um, one can also use similar analysis to look at development. Um, for example, one can study or scan um, young children and then a um, group of teenagers versus adult subject and see how does the different networks that we see, how does it change, how does it mature over age. So there's many different um, applications that are there other tools besides fMRI that you might use that will give you uh, different views of the same phenomena and, and enrich what you can learn by coupling them with what you're measuring with this device? Um, one can um, use um, other modalities. Um, um, for example, people have are now beginning to use um, EEG simultaneously with fMRI. That would give very high spatial as well as temporal resolution from which maybe we can get um, you know a much richer data set. Um, one can also use uh, other modalities like uh, positron emission tomography where which gives um, metabolic information about brain. It doesn't have the same temporal information but the image information 
one can basically map according to different receptors. On the other hand, one can use methods like near infrared spectroscopy, which has lower temporal, res lower spatial resolution, but much higher temporal resolution. So I think that's like a, a rapidly growing area of, of multimodal imaging. So this is all very leading edge, and, and, and you're breaking new ground in our understanding of brain function. How do you bring that back in the classroom when a normal process it probably would take five to ten years to end up in a textbook and turn into something you teach how do you how do you get this into the hands of students into the minds of students um, I think one of the advantages of um, working at NGIT is that because the student have very good um, mathematical and programming background almost um, I would say most of the analysis that I have done uh, for these subjects, I can teach it, and I'm teaching at undergraduate level, so um, I'm making a, them available, the fMRI data set for projects or assignments in the class, and the tools like filtering and motion detection um, that they're learning in the class, they can use it and um, you know, get um, better results or replicate the results. My hope is that um, they will come up with better ideas than I have um, and come up with better methodology even um, and how to analyze this data. So if your technology could actually read my mind, it would be uh, understanding that I'm curious to find out what are the other academic disciplines that can feed into enriching the work that you do? I've heard pattern recognition, signal processing, image analysis are certainly some of the things that we do, but what else What else are you able to tap in here to move this so that we are learning more, faster, and better? Of course, there is always a challenge that as we get huge amounts of data from each subject, once we process the data, it can be up to five to ten gigabytes of data um, and with such a huge amount of data maybe one can develop hardware based processing strategies or faster algorithms um, and so my hope is that I can work with other disciplines like electrical engineering, uh, machine learning and computer science uh, mathematics and life sciences um, to come up with better uh, analysis method and better research questions to ask. So you mentioned uh, mathematical sciences. We, I know we have several faculty members who grew out of it into our Department of Biological Sciences that were doing mathematical modeling of uh, neural processes. I wonder if what you're doing is in any way able to uh, enrich their work and to uh, provide confirmation of the models they've evolved for neural processing? Um, I think um, we can certainly use these models. Um, like for fMRI, because it's um, only about 10 years old, and as you mentioned, the exact mechanism between blood flow and neuronal firing is still being worked out. So from that point of view, there's a lot of work that can be done in collaborating. I hope to collaborate with them. Um, and we are already doing some work um, with math department um, to better understand these kind of analysis. So here at NGIT, we call it the convergence of life science, physical science, and engineering. Progress in medical and healthcare related technologies is clearly coming from our ability to mix up and match up classical biology and medical research, electrical engineering, mathematics, mechanical engineering, chemistry, biochemistry. It's an exciting place to be, and this is a good example of the exciting work that we're doing here in this new and important field. It's another conversation from the edge here at NJIT, where we make science work for everyone.